Obviously, America is dealing with a disaster right now. Many countries are, but we can't forget that for many countries, this is just the latest issue that they're having to deal with. And some have been in the grip of massive poverty, civil war, and other issues for some time. And joining us now to get us up to date with what's been going on with Syria recently is the senior correspondent and producer of Vice News, uh, Isabel Young. Welcome to The Damage Report. Hi, John. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you here. And, um, you know, in just a couple of days, uh, Sunday, 8 p.m., Vice on Showtime, uh, your episode of your experiences in Syria is going to be available for everyone. And, um, you know, I want to find out as much as we can about uh, what you saw there. Yeah. Well, I mean, so we went in the, um, at the end of February. So um, this was after a couple of months of the Syrian regime increasing their onslaught on the province of Idlib, which has about three million or so civilians contained within that. Um, you know, this is part of Assad's latest attempt to retake, as he said, every inch of Syria, which is in his intention. Um, and it's a really brutal battle that is taking place. I mean, what we saw on the ground was um, indiscriminate bombing of, of civilians, of hospitals, of schools, of medical facilities. And it was really, really horrific. Um, you know, this has become, it's been grinding on this civil war over nine years now. Um, but currently, this is the worst humanitarian crisis that um, Syria has seen so far. And uh, so I've seen various estimates of, you know, what percentage of the territory is now um, under the regime's control. Um, you know, as a, an outsider and obviously not an expert on this, um, I, I would have assumed that as uh, more control was gained over the territory, some of the wanton violence uh, might be scaled back. But it doesn't look like that's happening. And and you've seen massive poverty and increasing hunger and things like that. Um, so as you were as you were traveling and as you were speaking with people, um, what are the expectations in these regions for what you know the, the next period, the next few months, the next year actually holds? Well, I mean, it's not looking massively hopeful, I have to say. Um, you know, the day that we left was actually the day that there was a ceasefire declared. Um, that ceasefire is sort of still holding, but it is extremely fragile. You know, these ceasefires have been in place in the past and none of them have lasted. Um, the Syrian population that we're talking to and that I'm still in contact with um, have, do not have particularly high hopes about the ceasefire holding. Um, you know, almost one million people have been displaced over the last few months and not a lot of them are going back homes, which means that they don't really trust that there is going to be any form of lasting peace. And then you add on to that, what is happening with, you know, as we know, the coronavirus spreading around the world. Um, obviously, Syria is at huge risk. Um, you know, the WHO have described this as a slow moving tsunami, which is moving towards their country. And particularly Idlib is at risk because, um, you know, it's, it's a rebel held territory, the last rebel held territory. And so um, getting supplies, getting tests, getting um, anything there in a place where infrastructure is already so destroyed is um, it, it doesn't look like a, a very bright picture, I'm afraid. Um, I, I definitely want to return to coronavirus in just a moment. But because you mentioned the ceasefire, one thing that, that we've been wondering is um, when you're on the ground and you mentioned that previous ceasefires, uh, the, the situation right now is very fragile, that previous ones have been broken. And very often when these sorts of things happen, uh, it seems difficult from the outside to know exactly who is to blame for it. Often there are rumors and accusations, propaganda and things like that. How do you come to grips with trying to understand who actually is breaking it, what the conditions were that led to the break of a ceasefire? How do you like sort out actual verifiable information from all of the rumors and all of that? Yeah, well, as you said, it is really difficult. Um, and, you know, without being there the whole time, it's also more difficult. And also, you know, we're going there, um, we're being invited there by HCS, which is, um, you know, the the um, the group that is in charge and in control of that area at the moment. So um, what we're seeing is, is somewhat restricted. But um, what helps is that there are a lot of people who have been studying this area. Um, we've worked closely with a research group called Syria in Context, who um, does really close analysis on it. And they're also using open source investigative techniques to figure out where exactly the fighting is coming from. Um, you know, if these ceasefires are broken, who is breaking it? Um, and yeah, who's ultimately accountable? 
And um, so to, re to return to um, the coronavirus, and you, you, you described it as a slow-moving uh, tsunami, or the WHO did, um, the, the people there are already obviously incredibly insecure in a number of different ways, not just from violence, but probably disease, hunger, and all those things that we've been talking about. Um, I assume there's got to be quite a bit of fear on the ground about how bad it could be when it when it hits. And, and I wonder, with the, the current situation, how ready is the government to do anything about it? How willing is the government to do anything about it when it has seemed in the past to be quite willing to stomach, um, you know, a very high level of civilian deaths? Do you feel that the the ability and the will, the resources will actually be there to stop widespread loss of life from COVID-19? No, absolutely not. Um, I mean, the WHO have warned that up to 100,000 people in, um, in Syria could die from this. Um, uh, I mean, you know, the whole country is uh, really struggling. I think um, up to 70% of medical workers have had to flee the country. Um, but Idlib and the rebel held territory is particularly vulnerable given that, um, you know, cooperation between the different ad administrative regions is not particularly strong. Um, and they're already on their knees. I mean, these are people who are living in sprawling camps, if they're lucky. Um, some of them are living know, in olive groves, some of them living by the roadside, um, they really have no access to anything. I mean, the thought of social distancing or um, even having access to soap or running water is laughable. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a really, really scary time. And, you know, having spoken to people on the ground, they're just, they just sort of throw their hands up about it when you ask them because they feel like this is just one more thing. A lot of these people, remember, in Idlib province have fled from various different regions throughout the last nine years of civil war. Um, and they've, this is not the first time they fled. This is not the first battle that they've seen. And they have a realistic view when it comes to what happens next, because they, it's just so dire um, that they've, they've sort of stopped mm -hmm. feeling any, any fear. There's nothing left in them. And there, um, in relation to this particular disaster with coronavirus, there has been um, you know, quite a bit of international cooperation, different countries helping each other. Is that even is that even an option in this case? Would they have the access? Would they like if, if countries wanted to assist and try to stop that horrific number that you you mentioned earlier? Would that would that even be possible? Is there any hope that other countries, that the the UN or individual countries, could potentially come in in the near future and and assist Syria? Yeah, I mean, I think the the hope is limited, I have to say, because, um, you know, I think the, the Idlib Health Directive has said that they what they've seen from the UN is just merely words on paper. They haven't really seen any actionable um, uh, response coming from the international community. You know, obviously, the world is in a crisis. Um, every country is looking out for themselves. A lot of places have um, banned PPE being exported to other places. And we have to also remember that, you know, Syria and particularly Idlib is starting at a very, very low priority level. Um, it's not as if, you know, when 900,000 people or so fled um, to Idlib or fled to the border of Turkey over the last few months, it's not as if the international community leapt to help them. Um, you know, a lot of aid hasn't been reaching really people who are in really, really desperate need of it. Yeah. And um, as we alluded to in the beginning of this uh, this video, uh, this is going to be an episode that is coming out for for Vice uh, on Sunday. Um, what what are some of the other subjects that are going to be uh, covered in this this season on Showtime? Um, so for me, I'm covering uh, obviously. There's a lot of coronavirus uh, topics, which is inescapable. That, that's understandable. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've actually been in Italy for the past while um, reporting on the situation here, um, which, as we know, was kind of the first Western country to see a big uh, coronavirus outbreak. Um, I was also reporting from India um, earlier on. Um, and yeah, there's other there's a lot of other stuff that uh, is coming up. I'm not glad, I'm not sure I'm allowed to talk about it, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, then I, I won't go too specific then. I am just curious because, um, you know, obviously I have a lot of admiration for the, the sort of work that you do when you're going from a war zone to an area like Italy, which has been just about as hard hit as anywhere in the world in terms of coronavirus. How, how much worries do you have for your own safety? Um, I mean, I wouldn't say it's so much about my own safety, but obviously, you know, with something like this virus, the safety of other people um, and public safety is of our main concern. Um, and so a lot of protocols, a lot of precautions, a lot of um, 
a lot of mitigations have gone into place in order to just be able to move um, and to leave our home and um, a lot of analysis over whether or not that should be worth it. And so obviously, you know, when you're making a show that is an international series, um, these things are really challenging. Yeah, understandably so. But, um, you know, we we really do admire what you're doing and making sure that people have information from on the ground. Um, Isabel, the uh, three episodes uh, are available. We're going to have a link uh, in the description of this video where people can go watch that and and hopefully they'll they'll tune in to your episode uh, this Sunday and uh, we want to thank you for for joining us on the damage report today. Thank you so much John really appreciate it stay safe. Thank you you too. For more political news breakdowns, interviews, stories of activism and me trying my hardest to care about the occasional big celebrity news story, subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the damage report. And you can ring the bell wherever it is so you don't miss anything.